so much. Okay, so this is our second segment. And here we are going to be learning about experiences uh, for which, uh, learning from experiences rather, uh, for which we have Dr. Ritwik Tahake. He's an independent researcher and the co-founder at Resolve Diagnostics. Now, Ritwik is a senior virologist and an independent researcher with a focus on infectious diseases and public health based out of Bengaluru in India. He's also a freelance writer, editor, and works with scientists spread across the globe. Ritwik is one of the co-founders of Resolve Diagnostics and is currently working on the development of a novel COVID-19 detection kit. Ritwik, we are all eager to hear you. So, you know, the stage is all yours. I'm going to uh, mute myself and switch off my video. Please let me know if you need any. Thanks, Piali, for that brief introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Ritwik Dahake. And uh, like Piali mentioned earlier, that uh, Piali and I were working together uh, at my previous organization. And uh, we, um, after which I left my job and started working full time from home, which continued for a while till the pandemic hit. So I'll just give you a little introduction about myself and what I've been doing for the last few years and what I've been doing since the pandemic started and how this experience of remote working can be applicable. There are a lot of challenges sometimes. There are a lot of questions which uh, you all probably have about uh, how it, is it possible to do any kind of research uh, remotely and uh, how at least I dealt with some of those uh, hurdles. So after I left my job at uh, Research Institute in Mumbai, I moved to Bangalore with my family and uh, was an independent researcher, independent freelance editor, freelance uh, writer, um, which is fairly straightforward because uh, what, what happens is the researcher who I'm working with sends me his or her document, I edit it, I proofread it, I rearrange the references, and I send it back to them. And it's a back and forth um, communication via email. And uh, that's fairly straightforward. But what happens is uh, there is all, often a time lag between me sending something back, the person replying back, me working on it with other commitments, whatever, and sending it back to them. So you always tend to lose a little bit of time when you're trying to work remotely, as opposed to working in an office, working in a co-working space, whatever it is, where you're directly interacting with the person and you can see what is happening real time. So these sort of challenges are also there doing research per se, but uh, I like to explain how we dealt with some of those. So to give you a background of what I've been doing is um, one is this freelance uh, writing, editing, proofreading. Second is independent research, wherein publishing papers along with other scientists across the globe. Um, and thirdly, I've been part of this uh, company called Resolve Diagnostics. I'm one of the co-founders and we're working on a COVID-19 detection kit. Uh, um, so I'm going to break this talk down into three parts in that sense of what, what my experience has been as an independent researcher, what my experience has been as a team lead in a research organization which is doing active virological molecular biology research. And thirdly, a small part of it where, where I was uh, taking a mentorship uh, teaching assignment and how I navigated some of those things. So let's start with the beginning of um, as in the first thing, which is the freelance editor, freelance uh, writer, independent researcher. Um, primarily, I work with um, scientists, public health scientists, uh, public health researchers uh, based out of uh, Belgium. Uh, some of them are also based out of uh, the African countries, such as the DRC and uh, Guinea. And uh, off late, I've also been working with some, some of them from Cambodia. So it's fairly global in that sense. Um, the time zones are different. The timings are different in terms of trying to have a call, uh, things like that. But again, 
like I mentioned earlier, it's fairly straightforward when you're trying to look for a look at a um, freelance model wherein some the researcher sends me the paper, I look at it, I work on it, I send it back, they look at it, they make the corrections, they send it back to me, and it's a back and forth process. So that's fairly simple. But what happened is, uh, and that I've been doing for the last six years now, uh, what I was also doing uh, is uh, working with some public health organizations in Bangalore and where I would actually physically go and meet the person, meet the scientist, meet the researcher, see what they wanted to write about, uh, have a chat about uh, their research or their project, and then, can, then come back and write the paper. So, uh, but what happened with the pandemic is that this sort of interaction was absolutely not possible. And uh, we all were primarily, at least in India, locked down for a very long time. There was no chance of going out and meeting anyone. So everything had to move to online platforms. That's where online platforms like Zoom, Google Meet, whatever, all play and uh, makes things a little easier, but still this time difference, the time lag, which is uh, inherently present in any kind of freelance work, that still existed. But what interestingly happened is that because of um, the pandemic primarily and the need to come out with research, come out with papers, which are fast enough, quick enough for the, for the world to uh, look at, uh, you needed to speed this process up. So by speeding this process up, you needed to get more active on calls, more active on platforms like uh, WhatsApp or Messenger or whatever else. And uh, that made it quite fast. So we were working uh, at one point on a paper with scientists across the globe, literally. There were people from Belgium, from from the UK, from the US, from Australia, uh, all kinds of places, and uh, a collaborated effort which went into writing this paper uh, was quite uh, interesting as, a, as an experience simply because uh, the time differences which had to be taken into account. I was recently talking to a friend of mine who said that uh, she's been uh, she's in Australia and her boss is in Boston and because of the time differences with uh, daylight savings and winter setting in the, there's absolutely no way to have a um, meeting which is feasible for everyone so those sort of things do exist um, but at the same time trying to write a paper which needs to come out very early was quite an interesting uh, experience. And uh, we, we did manage, we have two papers based uh, out of, from this collaboration and uh, with multiple scientists from different parts of the world. So that was one kind of experience I had. The other one was, uh, the other, this thing is uh, primarily about um, the freelance work which I do where again, there's a lot of collaboration. And again, because of the pandemic, none of it could be uh, delayed in that sense because some of it is looking at uh, experiences of uh, people. Um, for, for example, one paper I was working in the DRC where they're looking at pandemic preparedness. And you can't be sitting around for weeks on end and saying that, yes, we are prepared because that, need, that information needs to go out today. And... Uh, so having to speed up things rather than taking your own time, having to constantly get on emails uh, or chats uh, with those scientists was something which was fairly new and interesting and required because of the pandemic. So that, that's something which um, is probably going to be around for a while. Um, and I think what has happened over time is that more and more people are getting used to the fact that things will be online. So we had we have the court sessions online, we have uh, ethical committee meetings online, we have all kinds of things online which, which would traditionally require physical presence. And that no longer seems to be the case, which is a good thing in a way, but at the same time, 
there are certain uh, factors which uh, make it slightly difficult, which I'll go into in a little while. So to just give you an example of uh, something different, which, um, which helps uh, in uh, online or of in online communication in that sense is this paper I was working on, uh, wherein uh, this company called Eristic uh, has these uh, devices known as smart glasses. And what these researchers did in Guinea, in DRC, is that they uh, gave the health centers these uh, smart glasses. And traditionally, what happens in most developing countries is that you have remote places which are not accessible uh, by road that easily also quite often. But they have health centers. And if there's a patient which needs to seek uh, more uh, a patient is referred to a district hospital, which is often very far away. Um, what used to happen before the introduction of these smart glasses is that the health center staff would not know whether this particular patient needed a referral or not, simply because it was mostly junior staff, junior medical assistants, nurses who manage the health centers, and the doctors are primarily in the district hospital. But what these smart glasses do is that they have a camera attached to them and they have a microphone attached to them. So when the health center nurse uh, is using these smart glasses and uh, conducting an examination of the patient, a doctor sitting in the referral hospital can see and hear exactly what is happening from the health center nurse's point of view. So the health center nurse is doing the examination this video and audio stream is going straight to the doctor who is then in real time giving his or her opinion on the patient and in that case then it's much easier for the health center nurse to say yes okay this person needs a referral or not and uh, in in case they do need a referral what in this particular project what they had also done was uh, connected uh, motorcycles into ambulances, which then could navigate through difficult terrain, which is often uh, seen in smaller rural areas where they're not proper roads, etc. So this intervention definitely is something which um, can be used in multiple places. Uh, and uh, these sort of things can help reduce the time, reduce unnecessary referrals, can reduce um, the staff to be present in a particular health center, the number of people required or specialized doctors being available physically, uh, those sort of things are uh, removed because of this kind of intervention. So that I thought was very interesting. And I thought we could use this practically in a lot of other places, not just in health centers or referral to hospitals, but in a lot of other situations which demand a physical presence which not be there. Uh, that also a little later when I talk about when it comes to later when I talk about digital, digital actual research, but with the in the but, uh, continuing with uh, the experience independent research. So another another example of something uh, which requires uh, independent requires uh, sorry I've lost uh, video and people can hear so you can hear me see me. You're audible, just uh, your voice uh -huh. cracks in between. Uh, okay, now the video and audio is on. Yes, yes, Gayatri, yeah, there's a lag. Uh, okay, I think. Uh, okay, I think uh, there's some uh, issue that Ruthwick is facing and uh, he'll be back. Yeah, there. Okay. Yeah, now you're uh, visible. Am I visible? Yes, yes. Uh, you're still uh, cracking a little. Uh, let me just get it from the audience. Uh, is the lag gone? Uh, is he is he audible? Is he visible to everyone? Yes. Can everyone hear and see me? Some thumbs ups, please. Okay. 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 Thank you, Gayatri. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> So, um, 
so another another example of um, uh, another paper i was working with with some scientists is uh, where they needed to uh, interview stakeholders and again traditionally what happens especially with public health uh, research is that you physically go and you interview stakeholders you give them a questionnaire you, sometimes it's uh, tablet based sometimes it's paper based but you physically need to see the person you physically need to have a rapport you physically need to see uh, where they're coming from in terms of whether they agree with certain interventions certain public health policies things like that uh, but again that was stopped uh, because of the pandemic so these researchers also had to move to an online platform had to um, develop their rapports with the stakeholders online through phone calls through zoom meetings things like that and still manage to have a decent amount of feedback from these stakeholders and uh, go ahead with their publication so these these are just some of the examples uh, i'm i'm portraying here simply to say that sure there are certain times where physical presence is required but at the same time we can move to remote working we can move to uh, online working for a lot of these um, situations now <clears throat> again traditionally there are a lot of a uh, lot of um, remote working so vector can move to remote working or medical coding can can be definitely a remote working you have proofreading freelance uh, editing writing these are sort of professions can definitely always be um, online or can be done through remote working but what about actual research what about uh, where you physically be there to hold a pipette so what about those things? Can those be eventually be robotized? Can eventually be automated? Can that happen? So moving on to the second part of um, what I've been doing in the pandemic is uh, being part of this organization called Resolve Diagnostics. And we are setting up, um, uh, creating a novel uh, COVID-19 diagnostic kit. So just to give you a background of how it all started is uh, this friend of mine uh, from Mumbai. So I, I live in Bangalore and this friend of mine from Mumbai called me up and he said, the uh, pandemic is on. Uh, we feel like we have some resources, we have some expertise uh, come, come to help people and, think and um, have a test, which is easier, faster, possibly cheaper, uh, definitely be able to use uh, be used in a point of care setting things like that so i said yes sure why not but uh, how will we work if i'm in bangalore and uh, the research needs to happen in mumbai so we said okay let's give it a shot we got a few people to be part of the team who um, i chatted with on the phone and we got some of our uh, equipment, we got some of our uh, reagents, we partnered with my um, previous institute uh, with um, the Department of Virology and I think one of the uh, audience is also part of it, uh, Dr. Sandeepan, who was very helpful and said, yes, why not? Let's uh, start doing it. So we started and I was sitting in Bangalore and uh, the team was sitting in Mumbai and trying to physical physically uh, molecular biology experiments so i don't know if uh, a lot of you all have experience with molecular biology but traditionally you have either real time pcr or pcr and you need to actually look at your results you need to look at your experiment data you need to look at your uh, calculations you need to figure out how um, your experiment is going to be planned uh, which is very very easy if you're there in the lab but when you're sitting somewhere else and somebody else is trying to do that, what what would you do? So we came up with came up with uh, WhatsApp messages. We came up with sending photographs of every single calculation and plan that is to be done, which is still going on. So I'm still in Bangalore, and the team is still in Mumbai. And every day in the morning we have a call, and then we decide on what. Uh, the experiment is to be planned for that day, any optimization to be done, how we should do it. The team then sends me 
pictures of their calculations, which I as on WhatsApp and I look at them and then if there's a mistake and then I say, okay, no, this is wrong. I circle it uh, on the image and say that, no, this calculation should be something else instead. Uh, so so some, some innovation in that sense has happened, but uh, often there are challenges. So especially when it comes to technique. So you, when, so we, what we, what we saw one time is that uh, between two uh, team members, we had variation in the result, doing the same sample, doing this, using the same reagents and uh, one person's uh, results were always delayed or not, or, or were negative, whereas the other person's were positive. So we were trying to figure what was wrong, what is different, is there anything different um, in terms of the reagents, in terms of the samples, in terms of the equipment, nothing was different. So it all came down to technique. So how do you gauge a technique remotely, right? So the simplest thing was then to have them take videos of it and send it to me. I would review the videos of one person versus the other person and try and see if there was something different in the way they did the, did the experiment. Now, that is possible when you're not physically doing it, but are the reviewer. It's definitely not possible if you're the one who miss, who's holding the pivot. So, uh, but if you are in a position where you are not physically doing the research, but are reviewing it or are looking at the results, then yes, it is definitely possible including things like training for techniques. So you have, you have ways of, again, online, you have um, tools uh, which can help this. Um, you, have, uh, uh, you can do on video calls and demonstrate physically where, when the um, other team members are looking at it. But what, what can help in, the, in a situation like this is something like those smart glasses. So you have a smart glass, the team is wearing the smart glasses, I'm on the back end, I'm looking at exactly what they're doing, how they're doing it, and give feedback in real time. So those sort of interventions, um, those sort of innovations will definitely not just be applicable in one sector, it can move on to multiple sectors. And um, just to give you another example, this friend of friend of mine is working um, on a virtual reality headset, which can provide training. Now, I don't know if uh, if any of y'all have um, ever used this uh, gaming platform called V. Uh, thumbs up if y'all have heard of it. All right. So, so just to explain to the others who may not have used it, so this, this gaming platform called V uh, uses uh, these hand gears rather than joysticks or controllers um, to map your hand movements to what's happening on screen. Now, this is not, uh, this is connected to a TV. The console is connected to a TV and you wear these hand gears. And um, so, for example, one of the games is playing tennis. So you have, you have your hand gear on your hand. And as you move your hand on the screen, you can see the player's hand move exactly how you are moving it. Now, this sort of technique or this sort of uh, uh, technology ha can get translated into virtual reality or what they now call augmented reality. So this friend of mine is working on a similar platform where he is using virtual reality headsets to provide training to people in, say, um, the aviation industry where there's a console panel with hundreds of buttons or uh, somebody who's working on a very large machinery again where there's there's a sequence you have to first switch on button a then then turn a dial and then switch on button b things like that so so to provide training rather than physically do it you can have these virtual reality headsets with these hand gears attached to to this virtual reality headset and simulate um, scenario where this training can be imparted. So, uh, for example, they were working with this aviation industry and they look, they were like, okay, they need to do certain things in a particular sequence. They have these buttons. So when training them, 
they, you put on this headset, you put on your hand gears, and you are physically in a space which looks like what, what it's meant to look like. So while, while you're sitting at home um, and uh, not in your uh, plant or wherever else it is. So those sort of innovations also can get extended to other platforms you can have. Uh, if there are, uh, for example, you need to teach someone how to pipette, you can have your hand gears and you have a virtual pipette which you are holding and you can press the thumb and release the pipette and do all kinds of things. So those sort of things hopefully will be available in the future uh, more, more commonly and can help provide training. So these are just some of the examples wherein some things can be done virtually, some things can be done using augmented reality, some things can be done using simple video calls, something can be done with just reviewing videos. But there are challenges which you need to look at. They all lead to time uh, as opposed to you physically being there, but it is possible. So <clears throat> um, moving on to the third part of it, which was um, I was doing um, online mentorship uh, program teaching uh, young students uh, virology, uh, wherein again, the initial bit of the explaining what virology is, talking about certain viruses, explaining uh, their structure or what diseases they cause, things like, like that is easy. But again, when you move to the instruments required or the tools required, uh, having an online platform is not always enough. So that's one thing which I've heard from a lot of other uh, academic uh, teachers and things like that, where teaching subjects where uh, you don't have practicals is very easy. But when you do have practicals, when you do have something which you physically need to see, it becomes a little more challenging. And uh, those are the challenges which hopefully over time, using things like uh, virtual reality, using things like augmented reality can uh, overcome. Now, there are, of course, certain professions where you can't do this at all. I recently heard a joke about um, a pilot sitting at home and saying, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain. I'm working from home today. <laughs> Which, which this is not, your pilot uh, speaking. My name is Adrian Oberhensley. I'm working from home today. <laughs> but uh, this is another, this is another, again, uh, slightly uh, informal joke from the thing where a farmer in Turkey was trying to put virtual reality goggles on his cows so that they can think they're outside grazing. And then therefore produce more milk because they are taking their living too. So um, these are the same kind of innovations which we are going to see from now on. Uh, the whole talk of metaverse and how things can be different. Coming back, I was just saying that um, certain innovations in tech, certain innovations in uh, virtual reality, augmented reality are definitely required to help uh, people actually physically do things which they physically can't do in, in the ironic as it sounds. But um, uh, I, I, th there, are, there are already things which are moving on. There are lots of games available which can help uh, people understand concepts better. There are, there are platforms which help people uh, look at uh, infectious diseases, for instance, uh, and uh, go ahead with those sort of things. So, so that's been my experience. It's been kind of uh, interesting in, in at one level, working remotely. Uh, yet at the same time, there have been several hurdles which. Um, can be overcome easily through simple tools like WhatsApp messages or videos. Uh, but there are times when we have realized that no physical presence would be required. So the coming to the crux of the talk in terms of is remote working possible for uh, scientists? Yes, in a lot of places it is. But in a lot of places, there are certain challenges 
which hopefully will be able to be overcome through multiple interventions and uh, newer technology, which can help help those sort of things. So I think I'm going to stop here. If there are any questions or comments, uh, please let me know.